All right, good afternoon, everybody. This is Dr. Mele. How's everybody doing? Good. All right, thank you for coming. And sorry for rescheduling this talk, but uh, we said we're gonna make it, so we did. So thank you for coming here. Uh, if you guys don't know me, I'm Dr. Mele. I'm one of the interventional cardiologists. Um, I've been with Freighter South about a year and two months now. And it's been a good journey and met a lot of interesting people. So we're trying to do this cardiovascular kind of forum. Hopefully once a month we can present a topic. And uh, I decided to start uh, with a kind of a generalized topic about cardiovascular disease. It kind of touches base on the basis of everything that we deal with in our cardiology department. And also introduce everybody to the different tests and the different uh, therapies that we have. Because uh, a lot of people don't know, you know how much we have here. We have as much as any big center does. So, um, And if you guys have any questions, feel free to kind of stop me. We'll have a, a Q&A at the end. Uh, and uh, you know, if there's certain topics you guys want me to kind of focus on, just let me know. All right, so we're gonna talk about cardiovascular disease, which is kind of a big topic. What does it mean? Um, so what is cardiovascular disease? Um, so anything that involves the heart and the cardiovascular system. So it involves certain disorders like hypertension, high blood pressure basically. Uh, coronary artery disease, patients with blockages around the heart, uh, patients with heart attacks, uh, patients with chest pains. Heart failure, uh, people who get congestive heart failure, uh, they need different kind of therapies. Arrhythmias, whether it's a fast rhythm or a slow rhythm, um, irregular rhythm, something we deal with. Stroke is actually a cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease. I mean, you have a neurologist that specializes in stroke, but a lot of times the stroke is actually a byproduct of something that is going on in the heart. So a lot of times when somebody comes into the hospital with a stroke, they call a cardiologist then to kind of figure out why did this patient have a stroke? So it comes back to cardiovascular disease. Peripheral arterial disease uh, is another uh, disorder. A lot of people think it's a vascular surgery thing, but also same umbrella, it's cardiovascular disease. It's because of blockages. If you have blockages in the arteries around the heart, you probably have blockages in your legs. You probably have blockages in your carotids, blockages in the brain. Uh, so it's the kind of the same disease process. It's just sometimes you go to different specialties to deal with it. Uh, in our department, we deal with the heart and we deal also with peripheral arterial disease. Um, and we have an intervention radiologist here that also deals with vascular disease and peripheral arterial disease. And then we have valvular heart disease. What does that mean? Well, you know, if you have kind of a, a valve in the heart, we have four valves in the heart. If one is very tight or leaky, you want a cardiologist to kind of look at it. It can cause certain symptoms. It can cause heart failure. You need certain tests to differentiate with it, whether this is significant or not. So it all falls under the umbrella of cardiovascular disease. So these are the kind of the big topics we're gonna to touch on today. And if any of you have any questions on one of them, feel free to ask. So what is the incidence of uh, cardiovascular disease? It's the most common cause of death worldwide. Uh, people may think uh, car accidents or smoking or cancer. It, it's heart disease, it's cardiovascular disease. Uh, so before the 1900s, you know, we didn't have antibiotics. A lot of people were dying from infections. Now most people are dying from heart disease, whether heart attacks or um, heart failure. Uh, so in 2010, uh, cardiovascular disease accounted for about 16 million deaths worldwide. So that's about 30%. And high income countries like us and Eastern, uh, Western Europe is about 40% of people die from heart, uh, cardiovascular disease. So this is kind of like the view, the, the white shaded areas on the map these are high income countries, Western Europe, US, Canada. So 35.8% of people, 970 million people die from heart disease. Uh, and then you can see the different percentages in, in different parts of the world. Now in Africa, it's about 8.8%, 8 .8%, but they still have to deal with a lot of infectious diseases that takes over like malaria, uh, you know, uh, West Nile or anything like that. So they have a, a less of cardiovascular disease. But in the high income countries like us, Australia, Japan, it's, it's cardiovascular disease. So risk factors, you know, th this, this comes from like um, old papers on, uh, you know, the risk factors for heart disease that, that goes back generations. 
uh, to the kind of like um, uh, Braun Walls, the, the kind of who wrote the book on cardiovascular disease, on what, what, what's your risk of having uh, a problem, a cardiovascular disease. So there's modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. That's the way kind of traditionally we have been taught about thinking about cardiovascular disease. So non-modifiable is easier to think. You have no control over these things. Your genetics. Your dad had a heart attack in 40, at 40. You're probably going to have a heart attack around that age or maybe 10 years younger or 10 years later. Uh, so your genetics play a big factor. Um, so if somebody in a family, a family member, like uh, your dad had a heart attack less than 45, you probably need to be checked out when you're young in your 40s to make sure you don't have the same problem. Same thing with females around 55. And we call that premature coronary heart disease because men, as you see below, males over 55, that's when they start having cardiovascular disease. Females, it's about 10 years later, about 65. So the estrogen that a woman has is actually cardioprotective, and after a woman hits menopause, they lose that cardioprotection, and they start having cardiovascular disease, but it kind of delays it uh, compared to men. Uh, gender, just being a male, is a risk factor. So unfortunately, it is. Um, modifiable risk factors, these are the things that are in our control. We can, every day, we can make little changes and makes us live longer, you know? So your cholesterol, you know, watch what you eat, watch your weight, eat the healthy stuff, not a lot of butter and a lot of fried food, uh, avoid the, you know, uh, the sunflower oil and the coconut oil, you know, stick with olive oil, that's the kind of the good oil. Um, that affects your cholesterol. Smoking, uh, that goes without saying, I think everybody, bought in into the, how bad smoking is in terms of cancer, but it does affect uh, uh, the cardiovascular system. And actually, when I do a procedure to look at the arteries around the heart, I can tell a smoker's type of blockages or a diabetic kind of blockages. Uh, it, it, you know, the smokers are usually many, soft, uh, friable. Uh, you know, I get a lot of patients that are young that have heart attacks, and usually they are smokers. They don't have any other medical issues. So smoking, quitting smoking is a big deal. It does make you live longer, uh, you know, reduces your chances of cancer and your chances of having a blockage. Uh, diabetes is another thing. Um, a lot of times we don't have control over diabetes, sometimes genetic, like a type 1 diabetes, a diabetic. So if you're young, you're 17, you have type 1 diabetes, you're on lifelong insulin. You have no control of that. But, you know, the, the diabetes that you get, the type 2, as you get older, it has a lot to do with your weight, is the way you eat, it's your exercise, your movement. Uh, so you really have, you have control over that, you know, you have to make some lifestyle changes to kind of make sure that, you know, you don't get into a bad diabetes situation that can affect your arteries. Um, a lot of patients, if they lose enough weight, they're not on diabetic meds anymore. They really kind of improve their glycemic index. Hypertension many reasons why we have hypertension. Again, there are some genetic factors, but a lot of it has to do with, you know, food. You know, you eat a lot of salty food, a lot of fast food, uh, restaurant food is usually salty. That can raise your blood pressure. Uh, also other situations like stress can cause it, sleep apnea, lack of sleep. Um, so there are ways for lifestyle changes to occur. Uh, abdominal obesity, just gaining weight in the abdomen. You know, the, the more fat you have, the more insulin resistant you are. Uh, you can raise your uh, sugars, you can raise your blood pressure. There's a lot of you to move around, so that's a problem. Um, a lot of times when people lose weight, they get off the blood pressure medication, they get off the diabetes medication. Um, and inactivity, uh, th which is a, a very interesting thing about inactivity, there was a study that was published a few years ago. Uh, they did it uh, somewhere in the Netherlands, I don't know if it was Sweden or Norway. Uh, so everybody in the country over there, they have like 10 million people, everybody from the time they're born to the time they die, they're on that healthcare uh, registry, you know, in the system, the same kind of uh, um, insurance, you know, it's a healthcare, it's a, it's a national health insurance. Uh, so th really they followed people who were sedentary more than eight hours a day versus people who are uh, not sedentary, less than that, and they work all the, all the time. And they found out that people that were sitting, just sitting down more than eight hours a day, have more medical problems, they end up with more diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. So activity, I would say, you know, for my patients, if you want to live longer, just keep moving. And that actually, you know, a lot of times that works. I mean, there are things, you know, you can't keep moving and smoke, but <laughs> if you put it all together, you're gonna live longer. 
uh, this is this is a picture uh, from an old Netter's book uh, that shows you know the typical uh, uh, modifiable factors that you can actually intervene on, which is you know somebody who's sitting on a couch drinking a beer, smoking, eating pizza. We don't want to be that person, basically. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about the first big topic was hypertension, leading cause of the global burden of disease. A lot of people see me for hypertension. Usually, they see a primary care physician first. They try to manage it. Sometimes they have a problem with medications. Either they're intolerant or the blood pressure is resistant. They need kind of to add a second medication, a third medication, sometimes four or fifth. Um, so they come to me, and you know, we go back to the same kind of discussion. You know, reduce your salt. Stay active. Actually, if you stay active, your blood pressure kind of goes down. Um, you know, quit alcohol, uh, quit smoking, uh, reduce your stress. If you have sleep apnea, you get a sleep study. Uh, kind of all plays around it. But you know, it's the first line to talk about uh, lifestyle changes. But you know, a lot of people can't. You know, some people who have arthritis, they can't really go ahead and jog and do all these lifestyle activities. So we really have to do the medications. We just have to cater the right medications for the person. It's, it's, a, it's a personable or personal uh, kind of uh, prescription. Not every, not every medication fits all. Um, so the treatment for hypertension, you know, like I said, first line is lifestyle modification. And then we reassess in three to six months. You know, this one is like the, the, the blood pressure that for hypertension, there's different stages. Stage one, stage two, stage three. So for stage one, yeah, we'll let you go, make lifestyle changes. I'll see you in three months. If your blood pressure is high, we're going to talk about starting a medication. Uh, but if you're stage two, we kind of, we know even if you do your lifestyle uh, changes, your blood pressure is going to be high. You know, if you come into the clinic with a blood pressure 160 over 90, I don't think that can be lowered just by diet alone. Uh, so we start some medications. Like I said, not every patient is the same. Uh, so uh, first line is a diuretic. We give you a pill called hydrochlorothiazide. Uh, calcium channel blocker, like amlodipine and nifedipine. For somebody with kidney disease, these are safe. They don't affect the kidneys. Um, ACE inhibitor or ARBs here, it's a type of medication like lisinopril or losartan. We give it to patient with coronary artery disease, patient with heart failure, patient with mild kidney disease, we can give it. So every patient is different. So when you come to a cardiologist or a primary care physician, basically, they have kind of cater to uh, every individual, their needs. But these are the first line treatments. There's number one, two, and three. Once you're already on the three, then you become in a, in a different kind of category, resistant hypertension. And then we have to add some fourth medication, some strong medications, and we have to look for causes. Why your blood pressure is so resistant? Then we have to do some other tests, make sure you're kidneys are okay, Do you don't have any renal artery stenosis, um, make sure that you're not secreting some abnormal hormone causing blood pressure to be high. Uh, so there's kind of a, an algorithm that we have to go through, and that's kind of following the guidelines from the American College of Cardiology or the Nephrology Association. Uh, so this is kind of what I was uh, alluding to. Um, so on the picture on the right, it basically tells you uncontrolled hypertension what can cause. You know, hypertension for a long time that you have not treated um, either acutely or chronically. Acutely, if you come into the uh, emergency department with blood pressure of 220 or 100, you might stroke out. You might have a bleed in your brain. You might have an aneurysm that pops in the brain. Uh, but slowly, hypertension that is uncontrolled for, like let's say your blood pressure is 160 over 80 for a long time, it can stiffen the arteries in the brain. And that can cause a stroke slowly, it can cause a stroke more slowly than an acute one. You can have some retinopathy, vision loss, your kidneys can fail, a lot of pressure for the heart. The heart is a pump, and it has, you know, if it has to pump against high resistance, like a high blood pressure, it, it, the squeeze is, is so much, it kind of fails after a while and just lets go, and then you end up with a dilated heart failure. So we don't want that. Uh, and a heart attack as well, uh, and sexual dysfunction. Um, so on the left side, you can see a list of which patients we cater to uh, in terms of which medication is best for which patient. So diabetics with some protein in the urine like albuminuria, we use like lisinopril or losartan. People with heart failure, we use beta blockers, ACE inhibitors like lisinopril or losartan and diuretics. People with kidney disease, 
you know, we use an ACE inhibitor or ARB, which is lisinopril, lisinopril, or losartan. African American, uh, they do better with calcium channel blockers or thiazide diuretics. And pregnant females, we have to be very cautious. We don't see that many pregnant females. I think in the past year I saw two for uncontrolled hypertension. We have to give them medications that are safe for the, for the fetus. So we, we, we can choose methyl dopa, nifedipine, or labetalone. So there are certain guidelines. It's not, you know, if you see your friend taking different blood pressure medication, uh, that doesn't mean you have to be on it. It's just everybody is different. All right, next big topic is coronary artery disease. Um, coronary artery disease means you have some blockages in the artery supply of blood to the heart. You know, the big thing that everybody worries about is a, is a heart attack, basically. Uh, but a lot of people are walking around with coronary artery disease. You know, it's just you know, it's just you have 50% um, blockage or more that's obstructive coronary artery disease. Um, so 50% of cardiovascular deaths per year is because of coronary artery disease, heart attack. Most common manifestation we call angina pectoris or angina. Uh, which is, you know, the typical chest pain. Uh, people say, oh, it has to be pressure, you know, it's like such a dramatic, I have a, you know, uh, I feel an elephant sitting on my uh, chest, radius to my jaw, goes to my arm. A lot of times it's not like that. People come in with like nonspecific symptoms, you know, they come in with like shortness of breath. Uh, it's usually exertional, like you walk a flight of stairs, and you know, oh, I'm winded. I wasn't winded last week, but I'm winded this week. Uh, I'm going to pick up the mail or put the garbage out, um, and you know I feel some discomfort. It's weird, you know. I took tums, but it didn't go away, you know. Um, we see that more in older patients, female patients. They come in with like atypical symptoms, um, and actually most patients present in in non-typical symptoms. Most patients present with like I'm short of breath, I have palpitations. Um, I don't do the same activities or I can't do the same activities that I used to. And that kind of triggers a different kind of workout. We have to start kind of think about it and we're going to talk about what kind of workout we do. So angina pectoris or angina. So everybody has risk factors like we talked about. So when you come to the clinic with no other uh, risk factors, we have to put you in this kind of like uh, little calculator. Are you a low risk, intermediate risk or high risk, okay? If you're having chest pain that is like, oh my God, I can't walk to the door or I can't one flight of stairs or walk around the house with chest pain and you go to the ER and you call the emergency uh, services, uh, then you're a high risk patient. Also, if you go to the ER with a heart attack, you know, it's not one of those emergent ones, but you know, we check your blood and you have a certain uh, enzyme called troponin that's elevated, you're a high risk patient. So we take you to a procedure called cardiac catheterization, which is an angiogram. We, you kind of go in there, not a surgery, it's a procedure. We go through an artery in the, in the wrist or the groin, and we inject a little bit of contrast and with an extra machine. And we look at the arteries like a, like a tree. We look at the trunk, we look at the branches, and we see all the blockages and we treat it. That's because you're high risk, we have to do it in a timely manner. You know, you have to be in the hospital, and we go ahead with the procedure. Now, if you come in as an intermediate risk, well, yeah, I mean, I walk a block or two, I get chest discomfort, but then I stop, it goes away, and then I resume, I continue to walk, you know? So it's not like such a dramatic kind of presentation. So these patients usually don't come into the ER, they come into the clinic, hey, my, I called my primary care physician, they said, come and see you, uh, because I have this chest pain. This kind of leads us to something called a stress test, and we have different stress tests. We have uh, different modalities, uh, many of them. Some on a treadmill, some, some without a treadmill, some, sometimes with a nuclear kind of camera, some with an echocardiogram, like an ultrasound. Uh, and if there's an abnormality on these tests, then we take you for the cardiac catheterization. But it's not as emergent. We're like, okay, we're gonna schedule this. Come on Tuesday next week, we'll do it, then you go home, something like that. Now, the low risk, the patient who is young, let's say a 30-year-old comes in, I have chest pain, no risk factors. You know, really, there's no reason to do any workup unless there's some red flags. Um, and we just tell them, hey, life, lifestyle modifications, um, you know, eat better, exercise, see how you do. Because, you know, the chances of a 30-year-old having heart attack is very low. The chances of things building up on the arteries are very low. Um, and actually, I should kind of explain about this kind of uh, blockages, how they come. So, you know, um, in, in, the, in the 70s and 80s, they made a study 
well, actually before the 70s, during the Vietnam War. Um, so uh, they took all these uh, dead soldiers from the Vietnamese and the Americans, uh, and uh, they, uh, uh, they dissected the arteries, the coronary arteries, the arteries that supply uh, the heart with blood. And they found out that the Americans already had stuff building up, you know, um, like cholesterol plaque, we call it plaque, uh, while the Vietnamese didn't. Uh, could be because of genetic factors or diet, because the Vietnamese mainly it's a plant-based diet. They don't eat meat. Uh, it's mainly rice. American diet's more, you know, uh, burgers and cheese and stuff like that. So <laughs> it's a different, and also genetics. You know, you have a, you know, uh, a European kind of genetic uh, population here versus you know Asian genetics. So it starts in your 20s. I mean, who goes, to, who, who's get, who gets shipped overseas for war? It's like people in their 20s, early 20s. So it starts in your 20s. Imagine and starts building up based on your lifestyle and genetics starts building up all that plaque till it becomes a blockage when you're 50 or 60. And then when you, that's when you have a heart attack, okay? But the chances of you having a blockage in your 30s or 20s is very low. So we really don't do a lot of these testing unless there's a red flag. And, and sometimes we don't do uh, all of it. And most of the time, I would say 99% of the time, the workup is negative for anybody who's young. So this is just for us, kind of, for me to kind of explain the probability of having a blockage uh, in your corners. So a treadmill stress test this is the simplest one that we do. You come in, you have an EKG, which is a tracing of the electricity in your heart. It looks normal, but you tell me I have chest pain. We put you on a treadmill and we connect you to a machine that continually monitors your rhythm. And we see if there's any changes there. And we see how far can you go on a treadmill. You know, if you can do more than six minutes, that's great. If you can do nine minutes, that's even better. Uh, if you score good, we tell you your risk of having a heart attack in the future is very low. Get off the treadmill, go home. So, but if there's something abnormal, then we tell you, okay, you did well on the treadmill, but you know, you did only three minutes, or your EKG looks weird, or um, you're having chest pain, you know, after going on the treadmill for a few minutes, then we probably need to go to the cardiac catheterization. We have to investigate further and look inside and see what's going on. The nuclear medicine stress test is, is, is adding to the treadmill some imaging, some imaging modality. So we can have you run on a treadmill, then we inject you with a, a nuclear isotope that has affinity to the heart muscle, and we scan you. And then we inject you when you're at rest, when you're not running, and we scan you. We compare the images, if there's a difference between the images at rest and exertion. If you have a blockage, just logically, not enough of the radioisotope is going to go to that area of the muscle, you know, because you have a blockage, not enough blood is going to the area of the muscle, so it's going to be different between our rest and exertion. Um, and then if it's positive, there's a difference, you know, called that ischemia, ischemia, not enough blood is, is reaching uh, the muscle. Uh, then we do for we go for the cardiac catheterization. Now, if it's normal, the images look the same. We say you're good. You pass the stress test. Your heart is strong. Uh, same thing we do with the echocardiogram. A lot of you have had an echocardiogram, uh, which is kind of like an ultrasound, like the baby ultrasound. We do it for the heart. We look how the wall walls are moving, and uh, if the wall is not moving well when you're on a treadmill, we say maybe that area of the heart is not getting enough blood when you're running on a treadmill, then you have to go for cardiac catheterization. So these are for intermediate patients. Like I said, people with chest pain, then we do this stress test. And we do all of this here, you know. We do the treadmill, we do the echo, we do the nuclear, kind of we do it every day. All right, now the, the most serious thing about uh, coronary artery disease is acute coronary syndrome, a heart attack basically. We call it acute coronary syndrome. There's one of those emergent ones, you know, they call us. It's emergent, we have to open the artery within 90 minutes. Everybody's running, Let's, you, know, you don't even stop in the ER. We rush you uh, to the cath lab and uh, we go in there and we open a balloon, we put a stent and you're, we're done. Uh, but these are more serious. Patients presenting with what we call a STEMI, uh, they present kind of, you know, uh, basically patients feel like they're about to die. You know, they say, I feel like I'm dying. They have a feeling of impending doom, they're sweaty. Uh, usually it's a main artery, a big artery that was blocked all of a sudden. One of these plaques that I was talking about kind of flicked off from the wall and created a cascade of clotting and the whole artery clotted. And then we have, 
minimal time to open that up. So that's kind of where interventional cardiology comes in and it's an emergent. And you have the, what we call a non-ST myocardial infarction or non-STEMI. These are the patients that come in with like serious chest pains. They feel it's more different than just me walking a block and stopping and then walking again. This is something that's more serious. I feel like I was, I was sitting at home, I was in bed or I woke up in the morning, elephant sheet in my, on my uh, chest. I can't move, I can't do anything. Anything I do around the house, you know, I feel this heavy chest pain and I come to the ER. And that's when we test the blood, see if the troponin is elevated, and then we schedule it for a cardiac catheterization. It doesn't have to be within 90 minutes. It could be because if there's an 80% blockage or a 90% blockage. While the STEMI, the ST myocardial infarction, these are 100% blockages. These are more serious and deadly. And there's the unstable angina, which is a form of the non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. It needs urgent therapy, it needs medications and a stent, but it's not as emergent, all right? So, you know, what, any of these presenting to the hospital, you need a, a physician to come and talk to you, get a history, physical exam. We do the EKG, which is the electrocardiogram, and we, we check your blood. It's very important to check the blood. All right. Make sure if your enzymes are going up, going down, you know, the higher they go, the more heart muscle died, so you have more enzymes that is detectable in the blood. Uh, this is kind of more of a dramatic picture of a patient who's having a heart attack. You know, hand, it's called the Levine sign. They put a hand on the chest, feel like I'm dying, I need medical services right away. And this is kind of the cascade, you know, uh, the, the circle that you're looking around, you know, there's, this is an artery, and then you see all this stuff. The white stuff is like cholesterol. The blue stuff is kind of your body's reaction to the cholesterol. And then you see the blood cells kind of uh, accumulating, and slowly they build up till they close the artery. And that kind of creates a cascade of clots. And that's, that's, we have to go in. Sometimes we have to suck them out and then put a stent in there. All right, so m main therapy for acute coronary syndromes, you guys probably have heard, take an aspirin if you have chest pain. Everybody knows, take two or three aspirins. That's the mainstay. Either you take it at home or the emergency department will give it to you or the ER will give it to you. Aspirin prevents the blood from clotting, getting together and getting, become a sticky. You don't want your blood to get sticky when you have a heart attack. Then you, it's, it's, a more, it's a bigger heart attack, more clots. And then something like aspirin, like uh, clopidogrel, uh, the brand name is Plavix, or Ticagrelor, which is Berlinta, or Prasagrel, which is Effient. And these are medications just like aspirin that prevent uh, blood from sticking together and creating a clot. And then we give you some nitroglycerin, something under the tongue, it dissolves, kind of dilates the artery, opens it up. So because, you know, once there's a clot, it kind of closes off, so you want to dilate it. We give you something called a beta blocker, then like metoprolol or carvedilol. This is a medication that kind of relaxes the heart, slows it down, lowers the blood pressure, so the heart doesn't have to work so hard. And then we give you a blood thinner, like heparin or low molecular weight heparin, like Lavinox. And this kind of like uh, prevents more clotting, uh, even more so than aspirin and uh, clopidogrel. Uh, back in the days, we used to give clot busters, you know, if you ever heard of that. It's called TPA or thrombolysis. Uh, this is before the era of balloons and stents. Basically, you come with a heart attack, they give you this clot buster. It makes you bleed from everywhere. <laughs> kind of uh, breaks down the clot, but also if you get cut, you're just going to profusely bleed till it's out of your system. We don't do that anymore, but certain situations in certain places that don't, don't have uh, the capabilities that we have here, they have to give you those thrombolysis, like the TPA. Uh, I, I trained in Miami in a, in a county hospital, 700 beds. So we used to get all these, like, uh, people who go on cruises and they get heart attacks, you know? So they get the clot busters out in sea, you know, they give them through the, an IV uh, somewhere in the Bahamas or something. And then the helicopter will come and ship them to us, and then we have to open the artery if it's still closed. So people still use those clot busters, it's just, when you're, if you are within 120 minutes uh, of a PCI cable facility like us, you don't need that because we can get to you fast enough within 90 minutes to fix it. And 90 minutes for us, we can really, the, the whole county, and then some. So that's kind of nice. All right, so STEMI, emergent transportation to a cardiac catheterization laboratory like us for percutaneous coronary intervention, which is PCI. And this is what cardiac catheterization is. We basically go, with like wires and tubes called catheters, 
And we go to the heart and we inject some iodine and we take a picture with the x-ray and we look at the tree of uh, arteries. So, and we look where the blockages are and then we start putting wires and balloons and open that up. Um, I tell my patients, you know, it's 15 minutes to take pictures, another maybe 30 minutes or 40 minutes to put a stent. Um, and three outcomes when we do a cardiac cath. Either the tree looks good, everything is fine, 50 minutes we took pictures, high fives, we're done. One or two arteries that are blocked, we can fix, we can balloons in. Um, and then uh, there's something more serious, you know, that can be fixed with balloons or stents. We take you off the table and we talk to you. Either you go for surgery or a high risk kind of stenting, which we can do, you know. We have a lot of tools these days. You know, if there's too many calcium, we have to kind of clean it up, shave it off. Um, uh, we have like uh, little cameras that we can put in in the artery uh, with ultrasound. We can look how big the artery is and what's going on in the artery. Uh, so, you know, there's many things we can do, but basically this is kind of the basic foundation of uh, what we do here with cardiac catheterization and, and heart attacks. And PCI means just, you know, you do a balloon or a stent. And after you put a stent in, you have to take, take some medication like aspirin and some other medication to keep the stent open, basically. You're putting a foreign body, your body's gonna react to it, wants to close it down. You give medications to kind of prevent that from happening. All right, any questions about that? Heart attacks? No? Cool, all right. Heart failure, um, this is an, another big topic. Um, what does heart failure mean? It's a clinical diagnosis, you know? You come into me, oh, I'm short of breath, my f legs are swollen, I can't lay back in bed without getting short of breath. That's heart failure. There are many reasons why you have heart failure. Is it either arrhythmias, or you have blockages, or you have some genetic disorder, many. Uh, so we have to treat what's causing that and also treat the symptoms. So causes, hypertension, uncontrolled, diabetes, coronary artery disease, myocarditis, which is an infection of the heart. A lot of people, I've seen this here, a lot of people with the flu. Uh, COVID, people with COVID can get myocarditis. People with the COVID vaccine, they can get myocarditis. A low percentage, but they can still. Certain drugs, some of the chemotherapeutic agents can cause heart failure. Uh, I like this picture, you know, the, the heart is kind of congested. It's kind of huffing and puffing. Uh, alcohol, people who drink alcohol every day, usually a lot, you know, five drinks a day, or you know, they get that. Uh, cocaine, amphetamine, a lot of people use cocaine here. There was a lot in Miami. Um, autoimmune disorders, you know, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, untreated. Um, but if you treat it, it can reverse. So history and physical is the most important thing. We can use some blood work to kind of indicate how bad the heart failure is, called the brain uh, nitrogenic peptide. It's like a, an enzyme or protein that your heart kind of secretes if it's stretched and congested, just like that picture. Um, not very specific. Um, but it's a good indicator. Chest x-ray, we get a chest x-ray, see if your lungs are full of fluid, you know. And then echo, echo tells us if your heart is weak or stiff. Sometimes your heart is weak, that's why your heart is congested, or stiff, it can't relax, so, and the treatment is different. And then we have to address the other etiology, which is whether coronary artery disease, alcohol, drugs, infections, and so on. And the treatment, the mainstay of treatment is diuretics. We give you a water pill, basically. You know, uh, we have many of those. And then things that help you live longer, if, you're, if the function is less, like beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, aldosterone antagonists, some other medications. And there's drugs that reduce hospitalization, like digoxin and the diuretics. So you, you have to cater to the cause and what the heart looks like on the echocardiogram. And you know, the whole goal is to keep the patient uh, out of the hospital, and feeling well that they can resume their daily activities. Um, so that's why we can, we, sometimes we have to adjust the diuretics. Every clinic visit, oh, take an extra pill or take a less pill and so on. Any questions about heart failure? No? All right. Arrhythmias, it, it, you know, I'm not the best to talk about arrhythmias, but I know enough. Uh, Dr. Chaudhry here is our electrophysiologist. So arrhythmia means an abnormal rhythm of the heart, you know. Uh, some arrhythmias are benign, you know, some people get extra beat, you know, some pe a lot of people feel palpitations, uh, they have like PACs or PVCs, premature atrial contractions or premature ventricular contractions. Every once in a while you might feel an extra beat, you feel your heart 
palpating a little bit. That's benign. Sometimes we order, so I get a lot of those patients, I put a monitor on them for like a week or two, and then I read them. If it's a, if it's a low burden, like a low uh, percentage, you really don't have to treat it. Uh, those are kind of, sometimes they're aggravated by alcohol or by caffeine. You know, stimulants can aggravate it. But there are some really serious arrhythmias uh, that we have to deal with. Uh, now, the serious arrhythmias can be fast, you know, heart rate going really high, 160 beats per minute. Some, peop and some people, it's really slow. You're having pauses or uh, your heart rate is like in the 40s. You know, normal heart is between 60 and 100. So if you're going really high or really slow, you're going to have some t symptoms. Some of the symptoms is palpitations. Some people pass out. Some people get lightheaded. Some people get fatigue. Some people end up with heart failure. And some get a stroke. Certain arrhythmias cause a stroke like atrial fibrillation. So, you know, first thing you come to a cardiologist, we get an EKG, an electrocardiogram. We want to see what your rhythm is. Uh, it has to be irregular. It has to be a normal sinus, what we call. So like you see here, uh, I have three tracing. The first one is normal rhythm. And you can see like, you know, it comes in, um, it's regular. These are beats, basically, electrical beats. Then you have bradycardia, means a slow rhythm. And you see there's a, like a big pause, you know? There's a missing beat there in the middle. So it's really slow before another beat comes in. And there's tachycardia where, you know, your heart's beating fast. There's too many beats, you know? And we treat each one differently. So tachycardia, the most common one is atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a unique, you know, even in the, in the medical guidelines, American, Cardiology, uh, American College of Cardiology, they have different guidelines for atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is kind of a world of its own. It's an irregular rhythm. It's not just fast. It can be slow, too, but it poses a high risk because it can create a stroke. You know, it's irregular. Uh, some of the chambers of the heart are not really beating. They're just fibrillating, and blood is not moving as well, so it can clot. And if the clot happens in a certain place in the heart and it travels to the brain, it can cause a stroke. So atrial fibrillation is kind of a unique, irregular rhythm. And then you have other arrhythmias like SVT, supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, that's kind of, you know, can be controlled better with medications or an ablation. Does not cause a stroke. Um, there's uh, rhythms uh, that are slow, but, you know, uh, that don't cause uh, a stroke. So atrial fibrillation is kind of Nowadays, we're more cognizant about it, more aware of it. It's more serious. Uh, one, one out of four uh, people over the age of 80 have atrial fibrillation. So 25% of people over the age of 80 have atrial fibrillation. Back in the days, people show up with a stroke to the hospital. We're like, why did they stroke? Now everybody comes in. They're hooked to a monitor. So like, oh, they have atrial fibrillation. So you know, the goal for us these days is to diagnose it early before somebody has a stroke. So that's why everywhere, everywhere you go, you know, you go to your, to your primary uh, physician office, they get an EKG. You go to the cardiologist, they get an EKG. Uh, you get a smart watch, you know, it tells you the rhythm. Sometimes it tells you you have atrial fibrillation. Uh, we have all these little monitors that we do. Um, goes without saying that, you know, you have to control the risk factors. You know, can be, you, you can have it when you're younger. You don't have to be 80 to have atrial fibrillation. If you have coronary artery disease, if you drink alcohol, is there certain drugs that you take, if your thyroid is hyperactive, if you have a clot in the lung, a pulmonary embolism. If you have sleep apnea, which is underdiagnosed, under a lot of my patients that have atrial fibrillation, I, I refer them to our pulmonologist and sleep medicine to get a sleep study. Sometimes diagnosing sleep apnea and getting a CPAP prevents people from going into atrial fibrillation or reduces the burden of that. And hypertension, uncontrolled hypertension can cause atrial fibrillation and tachycardia. Um, just because I touched on the um, atrial fibrillation, I want to talk a little bit about stroke. So, a stroke can be a clot um, and, and some dead tissue. You know, acutely can have a clot in the brain and some brain tissue dies. Or you can have something we call like a mini stroke or a transient ischemic attack. But per year, there's a million people in the US that have one of those. So it's a big deal. And uh, a lot of it has to do with atrial fibrillation. So, you know, when you come to your cardiologist, we kind of put you in this calculator once you have a atrial fibrillation. And, we can tell you the chances of you having a stroke, you know, in a year. And based on that score, we'll decide should you be on a blood thinner or not. So a lot of patients with atrial fibrillation, if their score is above three, it's a female with a score above three, they have to be on blood thinner, sometimes even if it's two. And for men, if their score is above two, they have to be on blood thinners. Like Eliquis, like Xarelto, like Coumadin. 
uh, something to thin the blood so you don't have a stroke. Because like I said, the blood, if it's not moving right, it's going to clot. And that clot goes to the brain, you're going to end up with a stroke. And what's worse than a stroke? You know, I feel a stroke is worse than a heart attack. You know? A heart attack, OK, you, you may have some damage in your heart, end up with heart failure, you get some medications. You, know, you can get by. But if you have a big stroke and you can't talk and you can't walk, really, your, your lifestyle is gone. You know, your quality of life is reduced tremendously. So really, if somebody has atrial fibrillation, we kind of make sure they understand you know, it's very important to take your blood thinner. Because you know, if you don't take your blood thinner, you're going to have a stroke. And we'll we can tell them the percentage if they want. And this is kind of your adjusted stroke here. If you look at the numbers here, a as the score goes up, you know, it can go up to 9. You have a 15% chance uh, of having a stroke. And that's pretty high. I mean, once you get to 2, 2% 2 chance, I think 1% chance is even high. You know, I, I want to have 0% chance of having a stroke. All right, so atrial fibrillation is an independent risk factor for stroke. You know, you can have any other disease, but once you have atrial fibrillation, you know, your chances is five times higher to get a stroke. Um, one in six strokes occur in patients with atrial fibrillation. It's two times greater likelihood of stroke recurrence in atrial fibrillation. So once you have a stroke, your chance of getting another stroke is twice, twice, twice as much. So how do you treat atrial fibrillation? We talked about anticoagulation therapy, the blood thinners. This is the one that you know, I underscored here. So it's an irregular rhythm that can cause the, clot, the blood to clot in the heart and can cause a stroke. So we treat that with blood thinners. But also we have to deal with the irregularity. We have to deal with the tachycardia, the fast heartbeat, or the slow heartbeat. Um, we have to deal that long-term atrial fibrillation. If you have atrial fibrillation for a decade or more, uh, there are structural changes that happen in the heart. The, you know, certain chambers of the heart become to dilate. They dilate, the valves start to leak, so, you know, new studies are, are come going, going towards, hey, if you have atrial fibrillation, maybe it's better to kind of get you out of atrial fibrillation. So sometimes we do cardioversion, which is, you know, just like you see in the movies, you know, those two pads and shock. We don't do the two pads. We put, like, two, like, uh, disposable pads on there. <laughs> we put them on the chest, and then we shock you out of it. Uh, sometimes, a lot of times, that doesn't work. Uh, because it's an electrical kind of circuit in the heart, you might shock it and reset it. It's like a reset, like a computer reset. Uh, but there's always a chance that's going to come back. So we refer you to an electrophysiologist. Here we have Dr. Chaudhry that we refer for AFib ablation. And he can go in there and he kind of create kind of, uh, um, kind of block all that circuit away, kind of isolate where the electricity is coming from, and then you can get rid of it. I don't know, the success rate is not really high. It's not 100%. It's high enough, you know, maybe 70, 80%, probably closer to 80%. Um, so, but few, few patients will need another one. And if they have another ablation, it's most likely above 90%, the success rate. Um, we also have medications that we can throw at you, but there's always a limit how much, how much you can tolerate from the medications, um, which is like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and antiarrhythmics. Uh, so these are the, the, the ways that we can control the arrhythmia, either medications, cardioversion, which is shocking you, or an ablation. And based on your risk score, you're going to have the anticoagulation therapy. You're going to have the blood thinning, okay? So you don't have a stroke. All right. So blood thinners are good. Not everybody can handle blood thinners, you know. Um, every time you need surgery, you got to stop it for a few days so you don't bleed during surgery. Oh, doc, I need to do my colonoscopy. Okay, you gotta stop it for two days. Oh, doc, I need to do this, you know, uh, trigger finger surgery. You gotta stop for two days. I need to do my cataract, they need clearance. I can't take my blood thinner, you gotta stop for two days. Doc, I'm not as active as I used to be. I'm using a walker now. I fell two times last year. Can't take my blood thinner anymore. Or, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to walk and break my hip and then I'm going to bleed and then, you know. There's a lot of reasons why people can't be on blood thinners. So what do we do? Thankfully, they made a new thing. So, and we have it here. We just started this year. It's called the Watchman Left Atrial Appendage. I don't know if you guys can see the, the arrows here. Uh, these are the number of studies that have been done on this something called Watchman. I'm going to explain to you what it is and the incidence of stroke. And basically, this one 
tells us that if we use this device, it's as good as the blood thinners. So what is this device? This device is called, huh? The blood thinners. Okay, as good as the blood thinners. So what is it called? This is called a left atrial appendage occlusion device. Basically, like I said, the blood doesn't move so well in the heart, so it clots. And there's a little pouch on the left side of the heart called the left atrial appendage. It's an appendage. It's like the appendix in your colon that gets infected and they just go take it out and you really don't need it. There's an appendage in the heart called the left atrial appendage. And because it's on the left side of the heart, if it clots, if, if the clots move out of that appendage, they go straight to the heart because it's on the left side, on the arterial side. It goes, I mean, it goes straight to the brain. And if it goes to the brain, you get a stroke. So the whole idea of the blood thinners is to prevent the clots from forming in the left atrial appendage where 99% of the clots occur in atrial fibrillation. So some smart guy, smarter than me, um, decided, well, hey, what if we close this appendage? What if we, we get a basket and we close this appendage and a basket that skin can grow over it and cover it and then you don't have to take blood thinners anymore. And that's exactly what we have now. We have something called the Watchman, left atrial appendage occlusion device. Uh, the procedure itself is very simple. It takes about 30 to 45 minutes, sometimes an hour. Uh, basically, we go in the heart through a vein with some wires and catheters. And like it shows here, you know, we go through the groin. We go to that appendage with some, you know, with some wires and catheters. Then we deploy this little um, kind of umbrella and then it closes the appendage, and then you're done. And you know, you come in in the morning, you stay one night in the hospital, and you leave before noon the next day, and you're done. It's amazing. And then you don't have to take blood thinners anymore. You have to take aspirin and Plavix, clopidogrel, for like six months, and after six months, you're just on a baby aspirin. And a lot of patients are already on a baby aspirin for many reasons, and that's it. And that's as good as a blood thinner. So for certain patients, you know, we go through a list of, hey, are you, are you, do you qualify for this watchman? Do um, you have history of bleeding? Do you have increased risk of bleeding? Do you have a risk of falls, a lot of falls? You know, something wrong with the blood thinners, you can't take them, let's say you're having many surgeries or um, you have some polyps and you're having so many colonoscopies or, um, uh, or you, maybe you're on Coumadin and your levels of Coumadin are up and down and you can't have a steady, steady uh, blood thinning level. Uh, if you have a stent and you need to al already to take blood thinners like aspirin and Plavix, you want to be on another blood thinner like Coumadin or Aliquis or Zeralto. Uh, if your kidneys are bad, if you're, um, if for any reason, lifestyle, let's say I have, I have somebody who's, um, who's a steel worker. He's on a blood thinner, keeps cutting himself. He doesn't want that, he's always bleeding. Imagine you're always bleeding, your clothes are always bloody. You know, he doesn't want that, so that's a candidate. You know, somebody who is very active and uh, works a lot with his hands and doesn't want to be on a blood thinner, that can be a candidate for this procedure to kind of reduce your risk of bleeding. So it's kind of nice. So we do this here. We just started, uh, where was that, like February? February, we started in February and we have a high success rate, it's just it's pretty good. All the patient goes home the next day. Uh, these are actually my picture, these are the ones that I did. This is how it looks like when we kind of release the device uh, into that appendage, and then we leave this little kind of uh, bell pepper shaped um, uh, occlusion, a little closing the pouch there. Interesting. All right, so moving on from the fast heart rate, atrial fibrillation, stroke, to the slow heart rates. What do you do with slow heart rates? You know, when you're sleeping, you have slow heart rates. Your body is relaxed, you know, you're not active, your body's not moving, so you have slow heart rates. It, it's, it's not a problem. You know, we, we review these monitors that we put on patients all the time. Patients sleeping, the heart rate is in the 40s, that's okay, it doesn't cause any problems. But it becomes slower than that, it becomes a problem. If people are passing out, it becomes a problem. If people are lightheaded, it's a problem. Uh, some people complain of fatigue, so we got to look why you're having that for, first because, you know, if you pass out, you hit your head, that's a brain bleed, uh, that's a black eye, we don't want that. Uh, people can have cardiac arrest, you know, if their heart is so low because, you know, the, you know, the heart is a pump, but it's all based on electricity. The electricity has to come to make it pump. The muscle might be okay, 
But if it's not getting the signal, it's not going to pump. So if it gets so slow and it's not pumping, not enough blood is going to your brain and your organ, it's just going to pass out. So we've got to look first at the causes, you know, make sure you're, you're not on a medication that can slow it down, make sure you don't have coronary artery disease, sleep apnea is big, a lot of these patients need a sleep study, uh, check your thyroid, check your electrolytes, Lyme disease can cause that, like serious Lyme disease, none of those like chronic Lyme, chronic fatigue syndrome, like acute Lyme where your, your heart is really kind of really slow, that becomes a problem. So the treatment is, you know, you got to treat the underlying cause, like I said, sleep study, CPAP, discontinue serum medications, treat the hypothyroidism, work the coronary artery disease with the stress test like we talked about or cardiocatheterization, check the electrolytes, get some blood tests, make sure your potassium is not low or high, and if none, then we'll put a pacemaker. So the pacemaker is basically a battery with two wires in the heart, and they kind of monitor your heart, see how fast it's beating. If it dips below a certain point, it kicks in, so if your heart, if we set it up at 50, if your heart rate is lower than 50, it starts pacing. And there's different types of pacemakers. There's single chamber, dual chamber, basically it's like on the top and uh, lower levels of the heart or just on the lower level. Um, and then the pocket can stay there. The battery, uh, the depletion of it varies. A lot of times it's just 10 years, but if it's pacing all the time, it might be sooner. Um, you have to get it checked every six months. Nowadays, you can do it at home. They have these little kind of wands that you can put in and checks it at home and automatically send this to our clinic and we just review it. We're like, oh, your pacemaker is good. Or we tell you, hey, so it's time to change the battery. So, or we detect some arrhythmia because it's monitoring everything in the heart. Uh, and I promise you, it doesn't send anything to the government. It just sends us the rhythm issues. <laughs> it's listening to everything. Uh, the other thing that we do here as well is a leadless pacemaker. So for, for some indications, you don't need the whole battery in there and the wires. You might need, you know, maybe your heart rate dips, you know, very rarely. Or you have atrial fibrillation that you need, you don't need too many leads. You just need something for backup just when the heart rate goes low. We have this leadless pacemaker is the size of a quarter that you can come in. We go through the vein with some wires and tubes. We put it in the heart, we release it, we come out, two hours later you go home. That's basically you know, two to four hours. And that's it, and it paces. So it kind of monitors and paces, and this one lasts about 10 years as well. Uh, there are times that you know some people deplete it sooner and they become pacer dependent. It's working all the time. We can go put another one next to it, and that's it. And you don't feel anything, it's just inside the heart. And there's no battery, there's no incision, nothing like that. Um, and we have that here too, so kind of nice. And that's kind of the end of my talk. I think it was a lot, but it's about a cardiovascular disease, different things, and we deal with all of these things here, and we can treat all of these things here. So. You haven't mentioned statin drugs. Where does that fit in? Statin drugs. Statins is one of the cornerstones for treatment of atherosclerotic disease. So there's different types of plaque. There's plaque that is soft, like if you guys remember the smoker plaque, smoker plaque that can flick off and cause this cascade of clotting. Statins, what it does, aside from lowering your cholesterol, which is a risk factor for coronary artery disease or cardiovascular disease, it also stabilizes the plaque. It makes it hard so it doesn't flick off. So statins, kind of one of the best things, best drugs that we have on the market to protect the heart from atherosclerosis, from, from the plaque, from the plaque flicking off. So it goes without saying, anybody with a heart attack, anybody with coronary artery disease, anybody with a stroke, anybody with a peripheral vascular disease, anybody with a blockage anywhere, whether it's significant or not, should be on a statin to kind of stabilize the plaque so it doesn't flick off. Statins cause a lot of side effects. This is the kind of the big deal. Everybody says, what if I get this? I'm like, well, you have to try it first to see if you get it. Not a lot of people get it, but there's a, I have a certain percentage of people that end up with these muscle aches. And from experience, I tried um, Crestor once, which is Rosuvastatin, and I felt like somebody was like sitting on my shoulders. I really couldn't move my shoulders. Um, I have high cholesterol, it's, it's 
just to say, <laughs> familial. Um, see, I said genetics, you can't, you know, you can't modify that. So, uh, but it, it's, it's real, uh, you know, I don't dismiss patients when they say, oh, I really feel muscle aches or cramps and I can't walk and I can't do the things that I used to do because of the stand. But you need something like a stand. So we have alternatives. So we have now uh, things called PCSK9 inhibitors. There's a group of medications that are injectables. Uh, some are every three weeks or every four weeks, and some every six months. You get an injection, kind of stabilize the plaque, and lowers your risk of uh, a heart attack or stroke and so on. Um, but if you can tolerate the statins, you know, I would say this is the best thing you can do is take the statins. Uh, but if you can't, we do have alternatives. We always, like I said, it's an individualized medicine. Not, you know, not everybody's the same. We have to kind of treat every patient individually. Any other questions? Yeah. I have a question about genetics. Yes. if it's premature coronary artery disease. So if it's a male less than 45 and had an event, uh, or a female less than 55, that kind of raises your, your or the, the, the kid's chances of having early heart disease. What age again? 45 for male and 55 for female. That's if, it, if any of if the parents had some cardiovascular disease or an event before those, that age then raises your risk of having. So you might have to have some sort of a screening test. You can have like a, a, a calcium scoring CT and that can kind of, kind of gives us an idea what's your uh, risk of having coronary artery disease. Now if it's zero, we say you have a low risk. Okay, so you have a low risk. <laughs> so that's what it is. So it, it's about all risk stratifying. You know, who, it's all about who should we do more for and who would the therapy just cause more side effects and harm. So I don't want to start somebody on a statin that doesn't need it or somebody on an aspirin that doesn't need it. In 2019, three studies came out, uh, late 2019, about aspirin, you know. There was this push for many years about everybody should be on a baby aspirin. Just put it in the water. Everybody should be on a baby aspirin. So they, they did this huge studies and they found out no, it's not like that. For primary prevention, if you don't have any cardiovascular disease, you should not be on an aspirin. It actually causes more harm because let's say you get an accident and you get multiple traumatic injuries and they have to transfuse you like 100 units of blood. That's not good, or people falling. And, but for secondary prevention, yes, that for sure you have to have it. So let's say you already had a stroke, you already had a TIA, you already had a coronary artery disease or peripheral vascular disease, and all these patients should be on aspirin. So primary prevention, people who didn't have a disease before should not be on aspirin, but people who already have a disease should be on aspirin. Go ahead. Um, for asthma attacks, uh, the Advair, which is a peripheral disease, um, that could cause heart attack mutations? Correct. Um, could you know, because I'm going to take the Advair? Yeah, so... Correct. Really so Correct. So the, the, the adver has like a albuterol in it or live albuterol. Uh, these are, we call beta agonists. Basically they work on the same receptor in the heart that causes the heart to beat fast. So for example, if like I'm scared and I want to run away, those receptors getting activated make my heart beat fast so I can run away. It's kind of same thing, but also it makes the lungs dilate so you can take deep breaths. So imagine this is the same receptor for a fight or flight kind of response, make the heart beat fast and the lungs dilate so you can take a lot of air and run. So that's why when you take the Advair, it opens up the lungs, but then your heart starts beating fast. So it's a side effect. If it's not, it's not, if it's not causing um, persistent side effect, let's say you take a puff of Advair and it's all day your heart is racing, it shouldn't worry. This is just a side effect only when you take the medication, I wouldn't worry about it. Now, if your heart is always high after you use the Advair all day, then you gotta come and see one of us. There are certain medications we can give to counteract the effects of Advair, uh, like, uh, 
non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers uh, like uh, cardism or diltiazem. This can slow down the heart uh, with that affecting that receptor, okay, which is different than beta blockers because like carvitol or metoprolol works against the albuterol or the adver. So, but having a fast heart rate, that's okay when you, when you need a rescue inhaler or the, or the adver. That's, a, that's a kind of predicted. We know you're gonna have that. Yes, and the reason you had the stroke also plays a factor. All right. So there's a lot, of, a lot of strokes that we call cryptogenic. So strokes happen for a reason, you know, there's a clot that went to the brain, we gotta find out why. That's why when you come to the hospital, we, you know, we scan your carotids, make sure your carotids that supply blood to the brain, they're not blocked. We gotta make sure that there's no blockages in the arteries in the brain, we scan your head. And then we get an EKG, make sure you don't have um, an arrhythmia. We also get an echocardiogram, ultrasound of the heart, make sure you don't have a weak heart, there's a clot in the heart somewhere. So, you know, first, first thing is the scanning. You know, if you have carotid that is blocked, an artery that is blocked, you just clean it up. You get need surgery for that. That reduces your risk of stroke again, okay? Uh, but if we don't find anything, everything looks good. So that we call that cryptogenic, we don't know why. Then you need to go into a different algorithm. We need to kind of make sure you don't have atrial fibrillation. We put a monitor on you for 30 days or we put a chip under the skin that monitors you for like three to five years to make sure it's not atrial fibrillation. If we detect atrial fibrillation, we put you on blood thinners. So it depends what causes the stroke. But once you have a stroke, your chances are higher to have another stroke. Yeah. I have always heard that it was for like six months That's your highest chance okay. of getting a stroke. But also you have to take the precautions. You've got to take the aspirin. You've got to take the statin. That prevents you, that lowers your risk of having another stroke. For example, for coronary artery disease and heart attacks, the highest chance of you having another heart attack isn't within 30 days. Okay, but that doesn't mean it's going to just drop after. You're still at a higher risk. It was just, that's why you've got to keep going with the medications, even afterwards. So a lot of patients come and ask me, how long am I going to be on this aspirin after my heart attack? I'll tell them, it's lifelong, you know. And some patients, unfortunately, you know, a few patients, they stop their aspirin or Plavix, and they come in with a heart, another heart attack right away. So, you know, people are different. Some people, uh, their blood is thicker and sticks much easier. You need those blood thinners. Yeah. Good question. So flutter, you know how I said in atrial fibrillation that, that some of the chambers are not beating, they're just fibrillating. In flutter, they're beating, but they're beating really fast. But still, the risk of stroke is high with flutter. Uh, the treatment is different. Getting out of flutter is much e easier than atrial fibrillation. So atrial flutter, uh, we can cardiovert you, uh, but you can go back into atrial flutter. Uh, I, I prefer to send atrial flutter patients for an ablation. These are easy to ablate. It's usually because uh, of there's a, a circuit, like a circle of electricity in a certain part of the heart just keeps going around and around and around. So the electrophysiologist comes in and just cuts that loop and then doesn't go around anymore and, and you're done. And usually after an ablation, you just need blood thinners for 30 days and not after. So you don't need the watchman, you don't need blood thinner lifelong, you just 30 days and that's it. So flutter is a little bit different. It's, it's, it's also one of those tachycardias, fast heart rates. And there's many of those, and the treatment is a little bit different. Atrial fibrillation is a unique one because of the high stroke risk. Any other questions? Do you know anything about um, mixed connective tissue disease? When ladies are pregnant, um, when they are pregnant with their babies, um, you're supposed to take a baby aspirin instead of the mixed connective Yeah, so mix. Uh, it's, it's out of my uh, specialty, but I know enough. <laughs> so mixed connective tissue is um, w one of uh, these diseases that uh, affects multiple systems. It's not just uh, connective tissue. It can affect the arteries. Uh, it makes the arteries stiff, makes the arteries small. 
uh, and when you do that, you know, the risk of clotting in small arteries is higher. So imagine the blood cell has to go through smaller arteries, so the risk is higher. Uh, and if you have another risk factor, like smoking or um, family history and so on, or lupus or something like that, so the clotting is much higher. And these people usually have smaller arteries. Uh, so the aspirin kind of makes sure the blood doesn't stick together, it doesn't cause clotting. So that's why they give it to the pregnant women because the umbilical cord, the blood has to go to the fetus, so it tends the blood so it can move much better or smoother so it doesn't clot. So, yeah. So yeah, these patients with autoimmune diseases, mixed connective tissue, uh, lupus, Renaud, um, scleroderma, uh, usually, you know, I'm, 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 I'm more aggressive in treatment. Uh, uh, even if they don't have, if they haven't had a stroke or coronary disease or anything like that, I usually put them on aspirin because uh, I've seen some bad cases where, you know, even if you want to do cardiac catheterization and angiogram, their arteries are so small I can't even put a stent in there. Uh, they don't do well. So, uh, kind of for primary prevention, aspirin might be good for these patients. That's a good question. The groin was the uh, pe people um, maybe up to five, maybe up to like three years ago. Everybody's going through the groin it, because the groin, the femoral artery is a big artery. Uh, people are more comfortable through the groin. People are trained traditionally to go through the groin. A lot of the new trainees, like myself, are trained mainly through the wrist. That doesn't mean we, go, we don't go through the groin. You know, it's all about anatomic variation. If you have a good artery and I can put my stuff through there, the, the wires and the catheters, then that's my go-to to go. Uh, but if, I, if, if your arteries are too small and I can't go through that, or you have some anomaly in your arteries, you know, twists and turns, I might go through the groin. Um, and for complex cases, you know, complex interventions that I do, I go through the groin. Uh, for big procedures like valve replacements or the watchmen or the pacemakers, we go through the groin because I can deliver bigger stuff. But uh, if I'm scheduling you for just for a cardiac catheterization, uh, I'll go th my first go is to go through the arm. It's, much be it's better for patient, um, it, it doesn't reduce the complications, uh, but it's uh, more comfortable. You just have a wristband for two hours and then they take it off and you go home. Uh, versus from the groin, you have to sit flat for four to six hours. Um, and there's a chance of bleeding. If you move, you can pop your groin and so on. Now we have some closure devices, so we reduce the time from six hours to four hours. Uh, but doesn't mean that you might not have the complication still. You know, you cough too hard, you might pop the groin. You know, you move a certain way, so you have to stay flat for four hours at least. Um, but yeah, all, all the new trainees are, go through the radial artery, so yeah, that's kind of now becoming the, the mainstream. That's what everybody's trained on. Any other questions? Really? That was a lot. Nobody want to talk about pacemakers? <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, everything I talked about is uh, the things we, we deal with every day here. And all the therapies that you see here, we have it here from A to Z, um, and uh, you know, my office is always open to everyone, and I'm always available, and I have my favorite nurse, who's excellent, Angela over there, you can always talk to her, she's pleasant on the phone, and thank you for coming. <laughs>